Uh, my role in my conversation, uh, I think it's going to sound a little different. Uh, and passionate, uh, maybe the right word. Uh, I usually view myself as more angry than passionate, but uh, it, it depends on perspective, I guess. So uh, I, I'm going to first start by uh, thanking Randy for his opening comments. I mean, I think part of empowerment begins with some acknowledgement that the system is broken, whether that's in Hawaii, whether that's Clark County, whether that's any bureaucracy that education is dealing with. Somebody has to stand up and say the system is broken. Somebody has to be frustrated enough to start taking action. So I'm going to talk really from my own kind of style of this and, and point of view. And I kind of want to set that stage. And it was funny too with, with Randy this morning. He had, he had said three things, he said, and it really was what I was, I had written the same three terms down, is that all of us come from and come with our own set of experiences, right? our own set of attitudes, and our own beliefs about work. And that's what I want to begin with on this first part of the conversation, is really about me and how I approach this work so you have a sense of whether it's worth your time to listen, whether I'm somebody who's speaking uh, honest and uh, has enough experience in different areas that you can see yourself or see your experiences in somebody else's voice. So that's what I'm going to talk about. My, my first thing I realized that I am probably a little more hostile because the, the background, even on my PowerPoint, is black. And you can't see it in this uh, bright room. So uh, uh, hang in there. I, I will talk through it anyway. So it's really about me. So I come from Clark County School District in uh, Nevada. That's Las Vegas. It's a huge school district. It's the fifth largest in the nation. We have about 319,000 students. We're in the entire south end of Nevada. We're also, I think, the 13th largest rural district, so we're, we're a very diverse community. Uh, we serve 200,000 lunches a day, we transport over 100,000 kids. Big district, big district. And uh, I want to come talk a little bit, I've been in the district for 29 years, I want to kind of talk about my background. So when we get to empowerment and why I, I'm standing here today, you have a sense of that. So really I began, like I said, I'm finishing my 29th year in the Clark County School District. I began as a teacher, right? And what's, the question you gotta ask is then what motivates you to move up in any system? So as a teacher, uh, I was frustrated then as well. Uh, and I don't know how many, how many teachers do we have out there in this group. So as a teacher, my thought was always, I could do a much better job of teaching if this administrator would just get out of my way. Right? If, I, if I didn't have to fill out the lesson plan form in exactly the boxes or the format they wanted, right? if I could place something on the left-hand side of the board instead of the right, I was a frustrated teacher. So the reason to move up was not because I was frustrated as a teacher. I loved teaching. It was that I could do my job better and I could provide for my fellow teachers what I would have wanted as an administrator. So I became an administrator. In between time, I also went from teaching to be a teacher on special assignment. I worked with math and science training for the district. That was an eye-opener, because again, as a teacher, you, you, you really view the, the district uh, as your classroom, as your grade level, as your school. When you start doing things district-wide, you realize, oh, not everybody does things like me. Both on, some are better, some are much worse. But you don't realize that really until you get out of your building. That's what really being a teacher on special assignment brought me. It also brought me, how do you start looking at a reform effort? In that case, it was about experience-based mathematics and science. Right? So how do you get people to approach kind of core content differently than they have in the past, differently than how they, was, they were taught? How, how do you make that change happen? So, so was, even then it was about kind of change in the system, how to do our work better. From there, really, I was an assistant principal and then a principal. I was principal at three different elementary schools. I started at Mac Kelly Elementary School in Las Vegas. Uh, it was at the time of my appointments, I still have the, the paper clipping, the lowest scoring school in the district. Uh, when I left, it was in the bottom quartile still. But it was at the bottom, so you have to have some celebration of that. I don't have a, a huge success to say there, other than I outperformed my peers, but I remained a failure uh, at that spot. I didn't get it as far as it needed to go. I was there about seven years, uh, 
working in that environment. A very tough one. It had a different approach to my thought about the work, and it contributed uh, some ways to my thoughts about empowerment as we get to that. At that point, again, being a high-risk school, Las Vegas was in a high growth time. Teachers could transfer uh, frequently and often and with ease. So your most at-risk schools were constantly losing teachers out to uh, more higher uh, social, not social uh, areas with uh, higher incomes and what was perceived as easier populations. So the stability of the school relied on the administration. The administration was the consistency. So I depended more at that time on programming, uh, defined procedures and processes, uh, empowerment, but at that point I wanted empowerment of me uh, and less about empowerment of the staff because the staff wasn't necessarily going to be there the following year. So the same thing happened there. I, I was frustrated. I moved to two different schools. So I worked at a year-round school uh, all along the same kind of road in town that made it from the poor section of town to the rich section of town. I moved to a more middle class uh, school next and finally opened a brand new built school, was able to hire my own staff and uh, uh, work with a very affluent community. Uh, my disappointment with that part was that when you go to create your own staff and hire again, you tend to recreate yourself. You know, so you think you have this opportunity, it's those of you again who are teachers, every year you start that year, like this year is gonna be the year. You know, this year I will not do this, this, and this, and I will do this differently. And then by Christmas you're yourself again and you pretty much have to recreate the same classroom again. So the same thing goes from an administrative standpoint with school, schools who ultimately recreate it, uh, which then leads to some frustration. But I was also frustrated by the way I was being managed as a principal. So much in the same way as a teacher being annoyed by the principals that supervised me, as a principal I was annoyed by the, the superintendents. We, we had region superintendents at that time. Uh, they annoyed me. So I needed to move up to do different. I felt like as a principal, I needed to be treated differently. I needed to be treated with a different kind of respect. I needed to be approached differently than I was being approached. So an opportunity came up, and this we'll get to later in the talk. Uh, I became an academic manager, and an academic manager at the time was different than a regular uh, assistant superintendent or a complex superintendent or the names you have to kind of supervise a group of schools. At that time, it developed a little differently, and the role was both to supervise a central department as well as schools, right? A noble kind of thought that if you work with schools directly, you could also influence the way central office behaved. And the more firsthand knowledge you had of schools, the more you felt their sense of urgency, the more wisdom you would have in your work with the central office piece of it. So my role at that time, I worked with school improvement, I worked with the district's turnaround schools at that time, the failing schools, dual language schools, so we worked to create a dual language program for the district, and a small piece of empowerment uh, just on the ground floor when it was developed. After that, that kind of became my, my principal work, was really the development of the empowerment model, the expansion of it in Clark County School District, and really that included every aspect of it. We were kind of ignored by the district. I handled the budgeting for, this, for the, the 15 schools, ultimately 30 schools. I handled the HR for those schools. I handled the supervision of the schools, the evaluation of schools. I was kind of the central department for that collection of schools, which gave you a first-hand knowledge, again, how departments, how central interact with schools, and where are kind of the touch points to make change. Then uh, I worked, we had a new superintendent, and I became an uh, assistant superintendent academic manager on special assignment. I worked with the deputy superintendent at that time, a new one that came in with a new superintendent. Uh, and after about six years of working with the empowerment model uh, in Clark County School District, that was going to be my moment, the moment that I could take these beliefs and ideas about how a district should function for the betterment of schools and teachers, make them district-wide, a year later, I was moved to a different location, and I am now the Associate Superintendent of uh, Operational Service Division, which includes the District's Transportation Department, Maintenance, Operation, Food Service, 
and constituent services, which was basically the district and planning department. So I will talk in the larger speech of that transition from being on the verge of empowering the fifth largest district to then being the head of maintenance and operations, transportation, and food service. It's an interesting story to me, uh, being the one who lived it, and I think there's lessons learned in that in, 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 in related to how do you approach the work as you all move forward? How do you look at reform? What are, what are the pitfalls of reform? Uh, reform? At one point, I was even considering calling my, uh, my presentation this afternoon botched empowerment because it's, it's just as easy to have success, probably more easily to botch it up than it is to succeed at it. And you really have to look at it hard and you really have to think about it and look at the failures of districts, even failures of your own district, to really determine where those things are and, and why they happened. I'm going to give you the answer right now. And then I'm going to repeat the answer in the, the, uh, the, the longer talk and then give you some details about it. But the answer really for me came down to five things. And for me, whether you're a, uh, a principal, you should have this approach. Whether you're a teacher, you have this approach. Whether you're in central office, you have this approach. So these five things should be customized to whatever your setting is. But if you don't believe in these five things I'm going to share, there really is not going to be much to get out of my next set of presentation. There's not going to be much to get out of the small group. There has to be some common sense of beliefs about how we approach the work. If you don't believe the same things, we're going to create something different, which is fine if that's the way you want to go, but it's, it's not the work that I believe in that I'm involved with. So uh, I'm going to give you those quickly. Again, this will be the first time you see them. I'm going to repeat them three times. Uh, this session, the longer session, the breakout, because I think you have to internalize these beliefs. And though they're simple, you have to think about the implications of, these, of, of acting this way. Because again, the difficult part is not the talk. Again, I've been in the system at Clark High School for 29 years, multiple superintendents. There's a very good talk that happens. Right? People say the right things. People learn the right terms to say. But it's a very big difference in how do you act that way. How do you let teachers really behave in a way that empowers them? principles to behave in a way, and how do your systems either support that or interfere with that? that? That is really the work you're undertaking, and you know as people in the system the difference. You know when the talk doesn't line up with action, and it's very simple. At one point when I was working with the school improvement process, we have to write school improvement plans. I'm sure you have to do something similar as sites. Right when I was first meeting with the central department group, I told them, look, the, the, from a principal standpoint, a school standpoint, as much as you want that school improvement document to be this living document, it is not going to be. It is not going to be. And that's a hard thing for them to hear. Why is it not going to be? Because you are giving me the form to use. It is your form. If I'm forced to use your form, it is automatically a compliance activity. If you want my thinking, then give me a blank sheet of paper. I'll give you my thinking and how I approach the work. If you want me to mirror back your thinking, give me the form, right? So even that kind of decision talks about how we approach the work and our thoughts about the work. So let me get to the answer that I'm gonna repeat multiple times. So first, there's five points again. And again, you have to believe these things. If you don't believe these things, you need to talk to each other. I should give you think time at the table to talk to each other, figure out why you don't believe these things. But I'm going to tell you these are the answers, so just accept that you believe them. One, the primary work of any district, and this could be school, happens at the school level between students and classroom teachers. Everyone else in the district supports that work. And I'll talk about later why, we're, why these are so critical. Because you can get people to argue about the details of implementation. The thing you need to get them to agree upon first is what things you agree upon. What are the truths? If you agree on the truths, the truth should then inform what decisions we make. Right? So you want truths. It's kind of a trick, right? You get people to agree on the truths. 
then I'm always going to, when you come to argue with me, then it's, we go back to, hey, hey, we agreed to this. This was true. Right? So hopefully you believe this. The work of all districts happens at the school. It happens in the classroom between teachers and students. So every action has to support that. And we'll talk about what that means. In our district, we frequently use the word teaching and learning. Right? But you can define this multiple ways. Two, the district holds principals and teachers responsible for the quality of teaching, accountable for student learning, and answerable for customer service. Right? So another difficulty we'll talk in detail a little bit later. The measures we use from schools vary from time to time. As a principal, some days I was measured by student achievement, some days I was measured by the number of parent complaints that came into Central. Some day I was measured about how well I implemented some process that the district determined was the winning solution to academic issues. Right? Some days I was, I was measured by how clean my building was. The measurements aren't constant. Right? So let's spell out what are we responsible for as a belief. We'll talk about the details of that. Three, those the district holds responsible and accountable for results should have the funding, it's the budget, right, the money, the autonomy, and the authority to determine how to best allocate those funds to achieve results. So this really, to me, deals with roles and responsibilities, clarity about roles and responsibility. People that are frustrated at their work, many times it's because there is a lack of clarity about roles and responsibilities. You're feeling like you're doing somebody else's work. Right? You have to have, where somebody else is interfering with your work. One of the two. Right? So you've got to have clear roles and responsibilities. Then, if you're given the responsibility, and you're going to be held accountable for that, you need the funding. When I work with my kids, if I give them $20, right? That is a limited accountability. That is li limited empowerment. Your empowerment is limited by the dollars I trust you with. Right? Got to be clear on that, because as you know, and I, I think I heard from the delegation that came out, you already have site-based budgeting, you already have the dollars at the site. The question is, are you getting 20 or are you getting $100? Are you getting your share? What level of central dollars are coming to the site, and is that the appropriate level? There has to be a discussion related to that. Four, all the employees of the district should know the results which they are responsible and how the results contribute to the achievement of district goals. Do you know how you're going to be measured? How success is going to be measured? Right? That's the problem with teacher evaluations. Do we know how we're going to measure our teacher's success? And do we have some common agreement upon that? Do we know how we're going to measure our students' success? And do we agree upon that? Results should be used to determine effectiveness of performance and levels of reward and consequences. People don't like the word consequences sometimes, but again, if, if we're about the work and we're about performance, with performance or lack of performance becomes what is rewarded in consequence. It has a consequence. But you've got to be clear, if it does not have either a reward or some sort of consequence connected to that performance, again, then the action becomes somewhat meaningless. Then people start becoming less engaged in the task. And again, we all get very good at this, again, especially people that work with Central. We start to know what forms are going to be looked at Right, with what level of detail, and whether or not, what, when is it going to be required for me to be, redo it when it's not? And we judge the level of input we have on that based on the rewards and consequences related to that task. And then finally, we have to agree that all stakeholders, public, nonprofit, private, have a role and responsibility in the establishment of highly effective schools. The most effective schools work in collaborations with all stakeholders. Right, so these are the five, uh, I think, obvious truths that we're going we're to deal with. And then I'm going to talk about why, and I just want to say it at the start again, why I think this is clearly the answer, the path you're on. If you look at schools, there, there's, there's two kind of uh, comments that have influenced some of my thinking. They're both fairly simple. One was Doug Reeves, uh, an educator. I don't know if you've, you've heard him or seen his work. He was the original author of the 1990-90 study. He talked about give me whatever your school situation is, right, no matter how difficult you think it is for students to achieve at your school, and I will find another school 
that is, has that same demographics, those same difficulties that it's achieving. Right? There is some place where somebody with the same set of problems as you has found success. That's a pretty powerful thought, right? The other one that's come to me, and this is with overtime in the district, is programming. Give me whatever program or whatever the latest thought is, whether it's you're all going to do a district-wide textbook adoption with a single book, whatever the school-wide, district-wide initiatives for that time, I can find examples where that initiative has been very successful and places where that initiative has failed. Same program, right? So I don't have confidence that program, there's no evidence that programming is going to do that. If there was, most of our comprehensive high schools would be implementing similar programs. The fact is they're not, right? Nobody's found that solution. So the answer for me is not in programming. So the answer then you have to look at, well, if somebody's being successful with the same demographics, the answer really lies in what was unique about that school where success happened. And that uniqueness has to do with the people and the instructional strategies they chose, that is a commonality between success, right? Success is based on the people doing the work. That's proven. That is proven. We know that. We know that just in our guts, that if you get the right people in the right situation, the work is going to happen. They're going to achieve. That pay, that's national, nationally. You can see that. There are schools achieving. And you know instinctively it's not programming, because again, you can have 15 schools with the same program, some succeed, some failure. So there's something more there. So you've got to think about how do we invest and how do we build around the people at those individual sites. And then how do we create a system, which is what you're trying to do with empowerment, that supports that set of beliefs. If we really believe that sites can figure out the answer, how does then central bureaucracy change itself to allow them to do that work easier. They can do it now, but it's work, right? You've got to overcome the bureaucracy. You have to do more work, so you're devoting effort and energy towards something that ultimately is not going to be paid off in achievement. So the goal is that you, not, you, you don't want to believe you can't do it now. You can do it with whatever system you're in. You might get a little bruised and bloody doing it, but you can do it. The goal of empowerment is to make that a smoother ride for you, to trust that you can come up with the answers if given that set of responsibilities and outcomes are clear. So we'll talk about it in detail, and we'll focus mainly on the places that, in my work six, seven years with empowerment and CCSD where I failed. I, I find that a much more interesting uh, discussion uh, for a group than places of success. If you meet teachers, administrators around the car, it's usually not talking about the great things that are happening at their school or the district. It's the miserable things that are happening. Right? That's, that's where learning takes place, is in that failure. So I'm going to really talk about my failures and establish empowerment in CCSD. So thank you, and look forward to talking to you more uh, later the, today.